Hi, everyone. Ahlan wa sahlan, and welcome to the launch of 11 Live Stories from Palestinian Exile. My name is Jana, and I'm a third year undergraduate student at the University of Toronto, as well as one of the programming assistants at the Hearing Palestine Initiative. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all today. We thank you all for joining us for this webinar, which is the first installment of Hearing Palestine's Nakba series for its 75th anniversary. We would like to thank our esteemed panelists, Muhammad Ali Khalidi, Perraisa, and Nadia Fahid, as well as our incredible moderator, Diane Riskadal, for taking the time to be here with us and lend us their expertise. We would also like to thank our co-sponsor, the Institute for Palestine Studies, especially Laura Bust, for all their whole hard work and support, without which this event would not have been possible. At the end of the panel, you will have the opportunity to ask our panelists any questions that you may have, and we invite you to do so by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen or by raising your hand. In solidarity and support for Palestinian voices, I will now repeat this information in Arabic. Ahlan wa sahlan fi hafir itlaq kitab, 11 live stories from Palestinian exile. Ana ismi jana wa ana taliba fi sana thalitha fi jama'at Toronto wa ahad musa'adai al-barmaja fi here in Palestine. Wa anahu min dua'i sururi an urahdu bikum al-yom. Nashkurukum jami'an li wujudukum ma'ana fi hadihi al-nadwa abra al-internet. Wa hiya awal halqa fi silsilat muhadirat here in Palestine fi al-dhikr al-khamisa wa al-sabi'in al-nakba. نود أن نشكر جميع المتحدثين المتميزين محمد علي خالدي، بير العيسى، وناديا فهد بالإضافة إلى رئيسة الجلسة المبدعة ديان ريسكدال لوقتهم وخبرتهم. نريد أيضا أن نشكر شريكنا في هذا الحفل مؤسسة الدراسات الفلسطينية وخاصة لورا الباسط لجهدهم ودعمهم العظيم الذي جعل اجتماعنا اليوم ممكنا. في ختام الحوار ستكون لديكم الفرصة لتوجيه الأسئلة للمتحدثين عبر استخدام زر الـ Q&A المتواجد في أسفل الشاشة with that being said, I would like to pass it on to Aida, who will start us off with a land acknowledgement. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Aida. I'm also an undergrad student here at the University of Toronto and one of the programming assistants at Hearing Palestine. We are gathering here today to share and to learn, and I want to start, it, start on a good foot by asking us to reflect on the land on which we live. اليوم نتحدث عن بعض طرق وعمليات الأمر في فلسطين وندعوكم للتفكير في أرض فلسطين وشعبها. I'm speaking to you today from Toronto to Toronto, Treaty 13 territory on the lands of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Wendat, and the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. This is also the land of the dish with one spoon wampum between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee. This treaty binds these nations to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. This is an exquisite place animated by extraordinary solidarity and creativity, but it is also a settler colony where violence and dispossession of Indigenous life and land continue to unfold, and where anti-Black racism and the uneven vulnerabilities to state and structural violence are laid bare. The ability to gather in this way may appear placeless, but corporate, corporate digital platforms implicate particular locales. Zoom has its headquarters in San Jose, California. This is the traditional territory of the Mawekma Ohlone tribal nation. Current members of this nation are direct descendants of the many missionized tribal groups from across the region. We who are able to connect with each other via Zoom are deeply indebted to the Mawekma Ohlone people as the lands and waters they continue to steward now support the people, pipelines, and technologies that carry our words and images across distances to each other. I'll now turn it over to Professor Diane Riskdahl from the City University of New York, who will be moderating today's panel. Great, thank you, Aida, and uh, thank you for that acknowledgement. Um, and also thank you to the Hearing uh, Palestine Initiative at the University of Toronto and the Institute for Palestine Studies. Um, today, we're going to be discussing uh, a very unique book uh, in the area of Palestine studies, which consists of 11 autobiographical essays, I've got it right here, um, uh, by Palestinian refugees, all of whom were born in or have lived in one of the refugee camps in Lebanon. The book is based on a workshop uh, in autobiographical writing organized by the Institute for Palestine Studies in 2016 where authors develop their life stories under the guidance of Lebanese novelist Hassan Daoud. Uh, the book that resulted was published in Arabic in 2017, and the English translation appeared a few months ago at the end of 2022. Um, we're fortunate today uh, to have with us the author of one of the essays in the book, Nadia Fahad, who currently lives in Canada. 
Uh, and we're also joined by the organizer of the writing workshop um, and the author of the introduction to the book, Perla Isa. And we also have with us the translator of the book uh, into English, Muhammad Ali Khalili. Um, but before we um, go into a bit more detail in the larger project, um, which um, we'll, we'll get uh, the details from uh, Perla, I did just want to note, um, you know, this is a, a, a commemoration um, of the Nakba series uh, that, that Hearing for Palestine is doing. Um, and in commemoration, um, there's often a political move uh, to counter the political erasure of the Nakba by creating an agreed upon definition of what the past is really like. Um, and this collective construction is politically important, especially with ongoing denials of Palestinian experience, um, such as last week's Israeli finance minister, Smotrich, stating that there is uh, no such thing as a Palestinian people. Um, but what I see as a real strength of this volume is that each writer voices their own stories and memories in such diverse and compelling ways, as we'll hear uh, more about. So beyond this more politically unified voice, um, we have a diversity of voices. And equally important, they're not just represented voices, part of some research project or an NGO report, um, of which there are many, but instead they're authorial voices. Um, so they're written not only by the writers themselves, but they're for their own reasons. Um, and some may be personal, some may be political, um, but in reading about the lived experiences of these authors, um, which are full of humor and melancholy and anxiety and joy, um, it becomes very clear that the personal is political in the context of the Nakba. Um, so I just wanna sort of have that framing in mind and thinking about um, what uh, a book such as this and the project itself contributes to the the overall um, discussion. Okay, um, with that, I guess I'd like to um, bring in Perla uh, Isa to talk about um, the project a bit. Um, but I first want to mention um, her role as a researcher and senior fellow at um, the Institute for Palestine Studies in Beirut. Um, she also holds a PhD uh, in politics from Exeter University and an MA in Arab Studies from Georgetown University. Um, her PhD dissertation won a prize uh, for the best uh, UK doctoral dissertation in the Middle East in 2015 and has now been published in, the, in a book uh, by UC Press entitled The Endurance of Palestinian Political Factions, an Everyday Perspective from Nahar al Camp in 2021, um, published in 2021. Um, additionally, she's also co-directed and co-produced a six-part independent documentary film series uh, entitled Chronicles of Refugee that looks at the global Palestinian refugee, refugee experience since uh, 1948. So um, welcome, Perla. Perla. Uh, I'm wondering, I'll kind of open the floor to you to just have you um, tell us a bit about what motivated um, your in interest in launching this product, project. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, thank you for this very kind introduction and thank you for all the people who are attending this webinar. Um, well, the idea for the workshop really first came to me when I started working at IPS. Um, I had just completed my PhD and uh, was grappling with a lot of ideas and with a lot of questions and also honestly with a lot of guilt guilt about the fact that I had uh, just spent, you know, a little less than a year in a camp, in a Palestinian camp in Nahal Barid, and had collected all these life stories that had enabled me to obtain my PhD and to now have this nice new job at IPS. And so my personal situation had, you know, greatly improved while the situation of the people in the camps had stayed the same. So um, I was trying to think of a way of, of giving back. How do I make you know, that relationship more equal? And then I thought that you know, since it was their life stories that had enabled me to, to gain a PhD, to become an author, that it would only be fair for themselves to also become authors, you know, authors of their own stories. So this is how the idea was born. And as you know, there's a lot of efforts to collect stories of Palestinian refugees whether it's through you know, oral history uh, projects or you know, journalism or filmmaking or theater, you know, all very important work. But here there was what was important to me that 
for them to author their own stories, for them to choose what they wanted to write about, what they wanted to focus on, and for their stories to be told in, door, in their words, so unfiltered by you know, um, academics or journalists or filmmakers. And um, what was also very important to me was that they take credit for that work so that they would be, that their names would appear on, on the cover of the book. And also through, um, through my work in the camp, I was, you know, I knew that there was kind of a large pool of aspirant authors, people who write uh, in their own personal and private capacity, but who lack uh, the, the, the opportunity to, you know, hone their skills or, or to publish. And, you know, as you probably all know, Palestinians in Lebanon um, are heavily restricted. They are uh, discriminated against, you know, in every aspect of their lives. So they have few opportunities. And so here I wanted to, you know, give this opportunity where they would, you know, the participants would get training and uh, publish in their own names, uh, their stories. Um, I don't know if you want to hear cut to, uh, there's a short uh, film about the workshop, Diane. Yeah, sure. Let's do that. We have a, a video that um, is on the Institute for Palestine Studies site, and it um, I, I think we have technical problems where the sound might not be working, but um, there are subtitles. Uh, let's see. We made uh, this movie as part of the workshop, so we thought it was nice to for you to sh see it because you would see scenes um, of the actual workshop, but unfortunately, the sound um, isn't working.
Thank you. Um, sorry for the, the silence there, but um, it is good to get some good context, uh, see what the actual experiences uh, sitting around the table producing uh, the writing would have been like. Um, that gives us a, a, a lot of, uh, of a sense of the sort of interactive dynamic that you know was involved in, in producing the writing uh, in the book. Um, now, uh, Perla, you mentioned um, that you had some ambivalence in your introduction about um, the, the motivation to focus specifically on autobiography. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how those issues evolved for you over the course of the project? Sure, yes. Um, as I said, initially, I think when I first uh, thought of, of uh, this idea of this workshop and the ultimate book that it would produce, um, I was really kind of limited by my own experience um, as an anthropologist who, you know, was collecting life stories. So the only thing I could imagine was, you know, a workshop about the writings of autobiographies. And uh, when I go back to the initial proposals I had written to kind of, you know, advocate for the project and to look for funding, I find that I was using the words true stories. I would, you know, describe this ultimate book that would come out uh, as being a book that would tell true stories of Palestinian refugees, you know, that was kind of <laughs> important to me. But then uh, when we started the workshop, uh, many of the per uh, participants kind of rebelled against me and saying, you know, why should we write about ourselves? You know, why can't I write about my neighbor, you know, or my friend? Oh, I know this person that has a great story. And um, it wasn't like they were questioning my intention, but I think um, uh, maybe this was a bit of uh, discomfort about writing about yourself, about you know opening up your lives for people. And with time uh, and with the help of uh, Hassan Dawood, the novelist who, who who led the workshop and who could, who didn't share with my you know my interest or my insistence on autobiographies, you know he was like oh just let them write whatever they wanted. So I said okay, <laughs> they can write you know about whatever they want in whatever way they want they wanted. And with time, I realized that really, again, um, I was acting like an anthropologist. I mean, I was trying to uh, change that, <laughs> to get out of that. But here I was, again, a kind of um, coming up with my own intent and like imposing my, my, my image, my intention upon people. And also having this kind of desire to kind of get to know more of this private, these personal lives that we don't always have access to. Uh, but thankfully, uh, no one you know, listened to me. And uh, I think that the, the book is, is obviously much, much greater and much better because of it. But I think, uh, I think it's still interested that, interesting that I think all of them ended up writing about very personal experiences. I think when you read the book, you really realize how personal these stories are. And I think that that evolved as the workshop was, um, was evolving, I think initially, many of the participants were very anxious about to find the topic what will we write about you know this was a big thing and so they didn't see their own lives as maybe worthy but i think as the writing started and the sessions were were ongoing and obviously the the leadership of hassan dawood uh, people ended up writing very personal stories um, because that's where the richness is uh, but they obviously wrote them in their own ways with their own words with their own style and uh, so, you know, nothing like kind of the linear autobiographies that, you know, I had initially um, kind of envisioned. Yeah. Yeah. Your comment there about the true stories is also mm -hmm. an interesting thing that's even contested by, by some of the authors in, in sort of exploring notions of truth and memory in their own writing. Um, and, and definitely there is a, throughout a number of the, the stories people retelling oral stories that they mm. grew up with hearing from their grandmother or their uncle or different generations of, of people that that really um, does a good job of uh, kind of weaving in these other voices uh, into their own uh, perspective in such a way that makes you realize how relevant those other voices uh, and other people's memories are to their their own understandings of uh, who they are. So um, I feel like that was a really nice absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think what we get from these stories is kind of their subjective reality. It's what was happening in their head, which is very true and very honest and very personal. But yeah, it's not like the true stories where we kind of 
describe objective reality of what was happening. And I think that's the richness and the uniqueness yeah. of, of this book. For sure. Why was it important to you um, for people to be just writing the stories rather than, than telling them? Um, it, it's, it's as I said, because if, I mean, I, I wanted them unfiltered. So, so that they are authoring, they're taking credit for this work that's being done. Uh, you know, because again, I saw myself as someone who came, went to the community, took from them and ended up with a product while here, I wanted them to use their own words, you know, unfiltered by, you know, academics, journalists, by anyone. Mm -hmm. And, um, and for them to take credit for it, you know, Palestinians in the camps often say there are people who profit from our miseries. Um, and in many ways, they're right. You know, many people pass through the camp, get something out of it get in a better situation because of it and the people remain in the same place. So here, I wanted them to have a chance to themselves, you know, obtain something from their own stories. Right, right. And I feel like uh, there's maybe also an added complexity in the writing process itself, in how you're explaining how the workshop developed, where people are able to sort of challenge their own ideas of what they're about to tell whereas, whereas if you're telling a story it's one ephemeral you know snapshot whereas this is a sort of more curated self that they're that they're giving mm -hmm. us um yes. uh, in a sense there's a, a complexity in that that's really nice mm -hmm. i'm wondering who you thought of as the main audience uh for the book mm. um in terms of audience really um I thought of it as ourselves, <laughs> and by that I mean like people who are uh, deeply immersed in the Palestinian cause. So people who were either you know born into it, who are Palestinian, or people who chose to educate themselves about you know about the history, about the cause, and you know stand in solidarity with Palestinians. So I never um, like this is not a book that tries to convince anybody about like the righteousness, but this. The way I see it, everybody may see it differently, but the way I saw it was, this is not about trying to convince anyone about you know, what the Palestinian cause is or who we are. And um, in a way for me, uh, I'm, I'm myself a Palestinian. Uh, for me, it was a relief because I always felt a sense of duty <laughs> that as a Palestinian, I needed to always kind of address the world, explain who we are, what we've been through and, and to kind of advocate for the cause and at times it may feel like a burden so in a sense this was a relief that we could just be candid we can write without worrying about uh, how we would be understood whether we're convincing enough um, and i think in a way it's very uh, therapeutic <laughs> that the audience kind of resembles the authors and in a way uh, there's something again that's, um, as I said, therapeutic in in trying and reading stories that resemble your own, and then maybe identifying as a, as a reader with some of those stories and seeing yourself in them. Um, so, so yes, this was what I had in mind, but maybe others, you know, thought differently. Yeah. Well, maybe we can. Um talk to Muhammad Ali a little bit about that, about what happens with the, the object of the book itself mm -hmm. when it's translated into another uh, language yes. for another audience. Yes. Um, but uh, one before we move on to um, uh, Nadia's, uh, I think she'll do a bit of reading for us and then also talk to her about her experiences. But um, I'm also wondering about um, whether you felt like it was important to have multiple generations of people represented in mm -hmm. the project and if you want to say anything about who who the participants are how they were selected and no absolutely uh a main goal of this project of this workshop was for it to be inclusive inclusive of you know all generations and all, all genders um uh, workshops like ngo workshops tend to often target the youth and I always thought that that was unfair because it's not like the older generation had any better chance op or opportunities in their lives than the younger ones. And in any case, older, the older generations have more stories to tell. Um, and, um, and when I'm applying for the workshop, so there was really no requirements other than having to be above 18. Um, and as we all know, Palestinians in Lebanon don't always have the chance to pursue university education. So looking at like for formal education or past working experience really doesn't help you judge kind of the qualification of a person. 
So what we did was we used, we asked the applicants to write a short text. It could be you know half a page where they would introduce themselves to us. We didn't want any CVs, just you know a written text of where they introduced themselves and why they wanted to participate in the workshop. And this was really what was important to us because through that we got to know them. We also got to know how 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 important this is for them, which was vital for us to be able to obviously complete the workshop and gave us an idea of their writing abilities. Um, and this was actually the first workshop, the workshop that led to 11 Lives is the first workshop that uh, we did. And so it was you know, experimental. And after that, we did other workshops and this continues to be the procedures of how we, how we do the application uh, pr procedure. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, maybe now would be a nice time to bring uh, Nadia's voice into this discussion since she was one of these uh, participants who was selected. Um, I wanted to uh, first int introduce her um, as a, a Palestinian refugee from Berger Barajni camp in Beirut, uh, who holds a degree in journalism um, from the Lebanese University and has done graduate work in media and communication uh, sciences also at Lebanese University. Um, you've also worked um, as an editor, program creator, and producer uh, uh, for Philistine al uh TV station, uh, Palestine Today TV station, uh, and uh, she's the founding member of the Palestinian Media Association in Lebanon, and strongly advocated for us not to run a silent video, probably because of her <laughs> media savvy, but... <laughs> But um, Nadia, um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your experiences uh, in participating in the in the project and, and how it affected you? Thank you, Diane. Um, first, when I saw the open call ads for participating in the creative writing workshop, I didn't think twice to apply myself, basically for two reasons. The first one is the institute itself, because it's a very sophisticated institute institution and it would be a privilege for me to be one of the accepted candidates. Uh, the second reason is more on a personal level. I wanted to know more about creative writing uh, in a professional way. And indeed, like for almost 12 weeks, we successfully managed to uh, finish our stories with the help of the Lebanese uh, author Hassan Dawood. He was such a warm-hearted person, a good listener, and um, he provided us with a safe environment, uh, especially for those who write for the first time. Like each session, we used to read our writings, uh, give, I gave each other feedback, and we laughed together, we cried, uh, we made, we created a strong bond be between each other. Um, it also it, it gave us the chance to speak up loudly about our personal and intimate uh, details. Um, it, we some of us weren't comfortable and or confident to speak them loudly. It was very beneficial experience on a personal and professional level. But um, I, I, in addition to that, we felt by writing these stories, we are breaking the wall of stereotypes we are subjected to as Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. Seldom do we find ourselves or our camps portrayed in a fair, positive uh, way in the media in Lebanon. Uh, we were dehumanized, we were marginalized, and we felt like it's unfair. But uh, recently, like in the last few years, there, we witnessed the rise in Palestinian channels and flags platforms who broke or successfully portrayed a positive um, approach for Palestinian uh, and showed stories of resilience, resistance, and creativity in, in, in the camps. Um, but between those two opposite approaches of, for the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, there lies a vast variety of stories for normal and regular people that are also worth hearing and reading about too. Um, and and the, this workshop uh, succeeded in addressing this gap by the stories you see in this book, stories that were written by 
refugees themselves um, who came from different backgrounds, different camps, different ages. Uh, they were written from heart to heart, uh, explaining or portraying or reflecting how the exile affects our refugee, our daily details as lovers, as mothers, as dreamers, as introverts, as teachers, whatever. Um, and I think the the the, the stories uh, like uh, make a good component of our Palestinian narrative, and it's part of our struggle toward liberation space. Great. That's so. It's so inter It really echoes the the comment that uh, Perla made about it being a kind of therapeutic process. The project <laughs> itself. Uh, this this idea of people coming together and working through. Uh, creating their stories uh, sounds really interesting. Do you feel that your your journalism training uh, shaped at all the way that you write your personal stories? Uh, maybe somewhat in the sense of how you see audience uh, in terms of who your stories are for, but in terms of your writing itself? Um, well, you know, like news writing is a completely different style of writing than literature or autobiography. Like, there are certain criteria of do's and don'ts that we are obliged to. There is no room for personal opinion or um, feelings. Um, of course, uh, like my uh, having a background in journalism helped me a lot in writing my story. For instance, I I, I used the, the skills in portraying the facts that I wanted to be in my stories. Uh, I tried to. I hope I succeeded doing that, like to be accurate, to be precise, to avoid boring the readers, to change my styles and tones um, of writing. Um, yeah, it, it helped me a lot to say what I wanted, but you know, like um, it's not just for entertainment purposes. We wanted, I wanted to inform the, the readers about how life is how the life in the camps is. And I try to include as much as facts and details in, in, in my story. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, I mentioned the, the, the poor infrastructure and how it's um, affecting the refugee or people residing in the camps uh, life and make it uh, even more difficult. And also about the horrible situation people are enduring in the camp. I can That's read great. some if you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we can. I just I do want to sort of make that, that connection that you you do um, add these personal elements to talking about the the decaying infrastructure, talking about water quality uh, when you're bathing your grandmother, or talking about the the electrical wires and the danger of that during raining uh, when you're walking in the streets with your daughter. Um, you know, these sorts of uh, very evocative um, uh, images really give a, 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 a qualitative sense to the kind of experiences, um, you know, that, that you're living, that, that, you know, one lives in, in a place like Burja Barajni. So I, I do feel like you were able to really um, both inform, but also yet really touch uh you know me as a reader in, in detailing those sorts of things um so yeah we'd love to hear from you if you'd like to read a selection um okay. it's, uh, it's the part that i helped my grandmother with <clears throat> my late grandmother may she rest in peace always relied on me to help her bathe to her utter misfortune and mine before the past time i would always send my mother on re reconnaissance mission to check the bathroom for cockroaches or other insects. The crawl space in my grandmother's bathroom was somehow connected to the neighbor's roof. Don't ask me how. <clears throat> the architecture of houses in the camp is real wonder. But what that meant, what that meant that it was a gateway for those repulsive insects. After ascertaining that the coast was clear, it was my turn to carry out maneuvers. I would grasp the end of the knob and position myself as far as away as possible from the door to the bathroom, standing on tiptoe. There I would shake and rattle the mop repeatedly, creating as much of a din as possible, giving my enemy a chance to exit the battlefield. At that point, I would draw closer to the bathroom, repeating my maneuvers again, 
and then and only then would I give my grandmother the green light to approach. The bathing would begin as usual and it would soon produce in us the familiar sensation of adipic salivation and claustrophobia. The space was scarcely large enough for both of us and with the door closed, I felt captive without an escape route of a, if a cockroach appeared from nowhere. It was a real source of terror for me when my poor grandmother could feel my anxiety and sense of urgency, but she never realized that what lay behind it was my fear of bugs, not my lack of interest in helping her bathe or my distaste for it. I never dared tell her the truth. I would have felt extremely silly saying, I'm afraid that cockroaches will come, Sipti. She was the type simply to swipe them aside with her hand, just like that, as though they were flies. To make things worse, my grandmother was a lawyer enthusiast for locally made soap, especially the kind made of olive oil, and she resolutely shunned the use of any other product on her hair. Washing her hair with a bar of soap took a long time, adding to my suffering and multiplying my anxiety, but my efforts to cajole her to use shampoo were all in vain. As the water quality in the camp deteriorated and turned saltier, my grandmother began to tire of the endless effort to scrub her hair with soap without working off the lather. She finally surrendered to the shampoo option. I had been waiting for this moment for an eternity, but she soon reversed her decision when her skin had an, an allergic reaction to, as she put it, that filthy shampoo that you all use. Of course, that was an only, to, only to be expected from a woman who had spent her whole life using natural soap and who had even made her own soap when she was still in good health. I remember her preparing a batch of soap on the roof and a large pot over a wood fire. She let it boil, then poured it into a metal mold divided into smaller cubes, telling me and my siblings not to play in the vicinity. She had one eye on us and the other on her various potted plants distributed around the roof. We could never understand why she won, won, went all, uh, all the trouble in the 20th century when soaps of all colors and varieties were at our fingertips. As children, we didn't appreciate how enlightened her behavior was and how utterly wholesome and ecological. That's a really nice selection there that really combines uh, some of these visceral details or real kind of qualitative details of daily life and the crampedness and, and different things like that, but also, um, you know, creates a sense of historical continuity for you. Um, and I feel like perhaps there's something um, about that in also bringing your daughter into uh, your story as well. You have your daughter and your grandmother, and I'm wondering if you, you were, um, you know, want to talk a little bit about um, the sort of intergenerational connections you were making. Yes, uh, growing up as a refugee in towns uh, make you feel like you are living in a, in a small version of your homeland. Like I went to Haifa Hebrew Al Jalili school, I visited the Jerusalem pharmacy, the gravity on the road, the picture of martyrs. They are, they are like a vivid uh, picture uh, or reflection of your homeland, which is Palestine. So Palestine was an abstract homeland to, to me. And the only living con connection to my real homeland is, the, our, is our grandparents, basically, because they, live, they were born in, in Palestine, they lived in Palestine, and they had to flee uh, their villages due to the Israeli occupation. Um, and the most important thing mentioning uh, our grandparents because they represent the roots and origin that extend from generation to generation. And it's also important because they uh, like to document their legacy and their stories because they are like witness, they have witnessed the Nakba. And because like Nakba is an ongoing event and now our lives is um, like the present is um, history in the making. We have to pass on what we are enduring and how it is, how, how Nakba and exile is affecting us uh, to our children. Um, why Nakba is an ongoing event? Because we like, 
we are witnessing nowadays uh, the severe attempts to silence our voices and to eliminate our existence. Like, for instance, look at my example. I, instead of being geographically at that, at closer to Palestine, I'm, I find myself in yet another exile. Um, uh, technology and the system is all also depriving us from our right of belonging. I can't even mention where I am from uh, on Facebook. Uh, for instance, when somebody asked me, where are you from or where is the country of origin? Uh, and for me or for my parents, like I say, I'm a Palestinian refugee in Lebanon. Also, then you are Lebanese, no, I'm not Lebanese. Then you are from West Bank, Palestinian territory, and then you have to explain it, no. Even like with, for my own parents who, who actually, uh, were born in Yaffa and Dhaka, like when they ask me, what is the um, uh, country of origin for your parents? And I say, um, Haifa, Palestine. Again, like it's, it doesn't exist. So it's the least we can do uh, to pass this legacy to our children, like we did from our parents and from our grandparents, and as they will do with their uh, children until the right of return is fulfilled. Again, as I said and mentioned earlier, it is part of a uh, struggle toward liberation and against being forgotten. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and certainly a good number of the stories do bring up those kind of uh, complexities of movement from um, expulsion into to today and how there's, you know, a series often that people go through and, and they can be very complex and individualized uh, for various people. And so charting all those different journeys is, is a, a really beautiful thing that happens in the book as well in terms of the diversity of it. Um, but one of the things I, I noticed in your story is you um, have a chance to return to Palestine and to, to go to your village, uh, which is a, a kind of an unusual thing for someone in your uh, position, um, maybe. But uh, one of the things you mentioned in your story is you, you needed to check out for yourself if it was really as uh, beautiful and, and <laughs> wonderful as your grandmother had made it sound like. Um, and, and so I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about that experience. Um, um, although it's been more than 10 years since I visited Palestine, it feels like it, it happened just recently. Um, I, I still have some sort of wound that is not healed yet and it actually may never heal. Um, I keep asking myself questions like whether I should have gone to Palestine or not. Why did I return to Lebanon? Uh, was I selfish? These sort of questions uh, leave me with contradicting and complex emotions and feelings. Um, as I told you, like we only knew Palestine from the news, from the stories of our grandparents, from um, the history and geography book at honor the schools that are no longer existed. Um, there, then there were no social media and internet as we know it today. My God, I feel so old. Uh, but as I said, like our homeland was something abstract, so I needed to experience it, to experience it fully. I wanted to feel it. I wanted to walk barefooted there on the streets. I wanted to smell it, to see it with my own eyes. It was like um, practicing my right of return, even for a short while. Um, it felt like a dream come true. It was strange, it was uh, familiar, it was heartbreaking, it was fascinating. It, it, it was like um, I was the missing piece of the puzzle and now everything is complete. I honestly didn't intend to um, mention it, but I let the flow of events and of my pain lead me to, to this, where I mentioned my visit to Palestine. Do you want to read a short excerpt uh, from that uh, section? Yes, yeah. Okay. We were on our way to fulfilling the dream of return. We drove to Yaffa and then Acre. The names of the villages in the district of Acre began to appear. 
I could hardly contain myself when I saw the name of the village of Sheikh Danun, which neighbors and intertwines with the village of Sheikh Dawood. We didn't know what we were looking for. We only had the family name. When we arrived in Sheikh Danun, we asked the village butcher about the Fahed family. He motioned us to keep going uphill all along the drive. I turned my head right and left to see if I could make out anything that resembled my grandmother's description. Could this be it? No, that's not possible. Keep going a little farther and a little, a little later. Wait, stop here. That must be them. I have no idea how I knew that that was the right spot. I just knew. It was as though I had known this house and its inhabitants for an eternity. The car had stopped in front of a metal gate behind which an elderly man and two women were sitting and sipping their afternoon coffee. Greeting Hajj, is this the Fahed family house? We just want to make sure. Yes, my dear, welcome. Well, the surprised and apprehensive response from the elderly man, he looked at us as though we were a group of aliens who had just descended from a spaceship. My God, I'm at my grandmother's house. I'm in my village. I'm from here. This is my house. This is where I'm meant to be. This is where I'm supposed to come every weekend and for my summer vacations. Why am I not here? Why am I over there in a refugee, miserable camp in Lebanon? I drew closer to them. May God give you strength. I'm from Lebanon. I'm my do I'm daughter of Petrahed. My grandmother is on Sheikh Hosseini. Her first name was Hosseini, but Hosseini was her nickname after her father's bird with a sweet song, maybe because she had a beautiful voice and it sang at weddings. The old man breathed a long sigh and got up from his cha chair to hug me. My dear, you carry the scent of the precious ones, he said, and we all started crying. Dear grandmother, life is tasteless in your absence. You left a large lump in my throat. It's a lump that hurts me and makes me choke. Today I visited our village, Sheikh Dawood. I managed to slip past the occupiers. I met your relatives, my relatives. I told them about you and they told me about you. And they related your common memories. I walked among our villages, neighborhoods. I visited its shrine and I read the opening prayers from the, from the Quran for the soul of your martyred brother, Salah, about whom you told me many stories. I stood on the ruins of the house that you were born and grew up in. The setting was just as you described it, only lovely. The cruelty of fate is such that it denied you your simple wish to die in your own land. It terrifies me to think that I might die far away. Your grave should be there, not here, in a forced exile in a refugee camp. I promise you that one day I'll sit beside your grave and read the opening prayer for your soul, but it will be there, not here. There, where your favorite lemon tree still remembers you, misses you, and is waiting for you. Thank you. Thank you. That's so evocative and touching. And um, it, it brings in a number of things, this, this uh, notion of intergenerational connections, the idea or, or concern through many of the stories about where is one buried when living in the exile and and how does one stay connected um, in interesting ways and um, maybe it's a now an opportunity to to move on to um, Muhammad Ali a bit because I do know in personal uh, discussions with him that this section that you just read <laughs> was something that was very moving to him to translate as well um, because of its uh, kind of potent connection to the homeland but do you want to say anything uh, more about that section before we move on Okay, um, I don't know, I just wanted to give the chance for Muhammad to speak, it's okay. Yeah, it's, it's lovely. Um, and also the connection to the lemon tree uh, is, is a nice one as well. There's a lot of a beautiful uh, natural uh, anchors that people have in the landscape uh, that come out in the writing. Um, so uh, let's uh, maybe bring in Muhammad Ali Khalidi to the discussion, who was the, the editor and translator of the English uh, volume. Um, he's a pre presidential prof professor of philosophy at the um, CUNY Graduate Center, where he teaches and publishes in the philosophy of science. Uh, he's written on various uh, aspects of the question of Palestine, including Palestinian refugee rights. 
His edited volume, Manifestations of Identity, the Lived Reality of Palestinian Refugees in Lebanon, was published by the Institute of Palestine Studies in uh, 2010. He's translated a wide range of texts from Arabic into English, including the collection Medieval Islamic Philosophical Writings. Um, so, Muhammad Ali, uh, uh, why were you interested in participating in the project? And maybe you could um, even tell us a little bit about your, your experiences in, in translating. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I learned about this project uh, from Perla uh, soon after she had uh, come up with it and conceived of the idea because of my involvement uh, with the Institute of Palestine Studies. And I thought from the beginning that it was a brilliant idea, as Perla mentioned, and as she also said in that short video clip that we played, um, the Institute for Palestine Studies produces knowledge about Palestinian refugees. We've published books and articles and sponsored all kinds of research. And I've been part of that. I've been uh, sort of guilty of that myself. Uh, I edited a book, as, as you mentioned, called Manifestations of Identity, the Lived Experience of Palestinian Refugees in Lebanon, which is a very presumptuous subtitle um, because you know it's, it presumes that academics, it's a collection of articles by academics, and it presumes that we know what the lived experience is of, of uh, Palestinians, uh, those living in the camps. So I thought it was a, as a great idea to ask refugees from the camps to talk about their actual uh, lived experiences. And um, I followed the project through the various stages. I wasn't lucky enough to uh, be in Lebanon when the workshop was meeting, but I think Perla was reporting back about it. And I think once the book was in draft form, I read it in manuscript, and I was really gripped by the stories from the from the beginning. And uh, actually, Perla, I think part of the reason that uh, she showed it to me was, you know, some of the, the stories contain some sensitive material. Um, a few of them are very self-critical. They're very critical of Palestinian politics, Palestinian society. Uh, patriarchy, gender norms, uh, things like that. And so we were just wondering about whether uh, we would be censored or whether it would be too sensitive to publish some of the material. Um, but eventually we just decided that there was nothing there that we didn't stand by. And of course, it's understood when we publish a book like this or any book that uh, not everything in it necessarily expresses the opinions of the Institute, but we felt really strongly that we should publish these essays as they were candidly without any attempt to, you know, soften or censor or silence anything that they were saying. So it was really very, it, it was very, I found the essays very compelling from, from the beginning. And I think even, you know, the first time I read them, I thought, you know, I think these essays should get a wider audience and um, it would be great if we could translate them into English because I think it's a side of the Palestinian lived experience that isn't widely known and would be of interest to many people uh, who may not know Arabic and would, wouldn't be able to read the original essays. So it was, um, it was really you know, something that I very much strongly believed in from, from the beginning. Um, and eventually, I mean, we had the idea that we would maybe have the 11 essays translated by 11 different people, but it turned out to be very difficult to coordinate. And I just decided I was so, I was so gripped by these essays that um, I should try and translate them myself, which might have been presumptuous on my part, but I almost couldn't stop myself. And I started by translating one chapter, and then I start. I thought, well, let me try another one. And pretty soon, I found myself translating the whole book. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And perhaps pandemic lockdown had a little something to do with. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It was a COVID labor of love. I found myself uh, cooped up with more uh, time than I usually had from teaching philosophy. And so I found that I had some free time in the evenings to sit down every day and translate uh, a few paragraphs. In, in thinking about um, the sort of uh, connection that you had in translating the section that uh, Nadia just read, um, I'm wondering what you, um, if you could talk a little bit about 
whether you feel like it's important for a translator to have cultural familiarity uh, with the, the material uh, they're translating, particularly Palestinian life in Lebanon. Yeah, I mean, that passage, uh, there are lots of uh, very moving passages in this book, but that passage is one that really always uh, gets me to choke up and, uh, you know, really moves me maybe more than any other passage in the book. Um, that line, my dear, you carry the scent of the precious ones, always kind of makes me falter. Um, and, you know, maybe part of it is because I'm one of those also who is privileged enough to be able to return to Palestine on occasion. I'm, I'm not able to live there, but because um, I have um, Canadian citizenship, I'm able to travel there and to visit people. And it is true, I've shared, I've had similar sorts of experiences where I meet family members that I never knew I had, and I meet others who are connected to me and to people I know in certain ways. And I always, you know, there's always a lot of welcome, and they're always very, very happy and glad to see me, which I wasn't always expecting. I mean, when I go to Palestine, and I was just in Jerusalem, I was very fortunate enough to be in Jerusalem two or three weeks ago. And every time I'm just surprised by how much you're welcomed when you go as a Palestinian. And there isn't, you know, I sometimes feel like there might be some resentment. Here we are, we're living uh, under occupation. We're living uh, in a system of oppression and apartheid. And someone like me is privileged enough to be outside, but um, I don't get that kind of um, resentment at all. So I think maybe part part of my being so moved by um, many of these stories is that there's a kind of element of shared experience that all Palestinians have. And I also am familiar a little bit with the context of the of the refugee camps in Lebanon. I mean, i'm I'm Palestinian. I was born in Lebanon. I'm a second generation refugee because my father was forced to leave his, his home uh, in Jerusalem where he was born uh, in 1948. But I'm privileged. I never had to live in a refugee camp. I came from a comfortable background uh, where I was you know, uh, very lucky to get a decent education and be able to travel abroad and, and so on. Uh, so I come from a position of privilege, but I do know the context of the camps. I have friends who have lived and grown up in the camps, and I've visited them. Um, I've also visited um, in the camps to do things like community outreach and talk about the right of return and the right of self-determination and give presentations in, in all, you know, most of these places, Ain al-Halwi, Burj al-Brajni, Nahr al-Barid, Shatila. So... You know, I'm I'm familiar uh, with the context to some extent, and maybe that gave me a bit of confidence, and made me feel comfortable enough to think that I could give voice to their uh, stories and to express their thoughts and sentiments. Um, I also happen to know a few of the authors personally uh, from various contexts, so I uh, I know I think at least three of them, uh, and now I know Nadia from <laughs> virtually. But uh, three of them I know from from having lived in, and grown up in Lebanon. So um, that, I think, maybe emboldened me to feel like I could express uh, their thoughts and translate their words into English. Mm -hmm. All those touchstones are, you know, feature very prominently uh, in the reoccurring themes, I think, as well. Um, a lot of discussion of um, moving backwards and forwards in time as well as as place you know these these sort of movements that you're talking about about whether you're able to be in Palestine how you're connecting to these different camps and and your life uh, in Beirut itself um, are are evident also in the writings that that people have but um, in thinking of some of the the recurring themes um, do you think that space and time in particular um, have a you know, are, are something uh, worth poking at a little bit here? Yeah, I mean, space, uh, I think, to uh, also echo something that Nadia said about uh, the space of the camp being very much 
of Palestine and Palestinian with Palestinian symbols and flags and icons, and at the same time, very distant from Palestine. I think one of the stories, Amira Sidawi's story, says at some point, this camp does not resemble Palestine. It is of Palestine, but it's, you know, it doesn't reflect the landscape of Palestine. It doesn't have the, you know, all the different uh, aspects or the, the qualities of that living in Palestine would afford you. I mean, for one thing, uh, it's a very cramped space. Uh, there is something that occurs in almost, I think, all the essays, the narrow alleyways, the claustrophobic sense, uh, the, the sense that people live in each other's business, they can't avoid each other. And it's a paradox because it leads to intimacy and solidarity and fellow feeling among people who live in the camps. But it also leaves, leads to a sense of claustrophobia that I just want to get out. I want to escape from this space. So it has that kind of dual aspect, I think, for many of the many of the authors uh, in, in these essays. You find both of these things um, when it comes to space. When it comes to time, it's very interesting because, you know, again, as Nadia said, it's an ongoing Nakba, it's an ongoing displacement. People feel uh, the moment of 48 very prominently in their lives. They relive it. Uh, they relive it partly through the stories of their grandparents who are survivors, but also they relive it from the very fact that it shapes and frames their lives. It, it explains uh, why they don't have uh, citizenship, why they don't have rights, why they can't go uh, back to Palestine. So um, some of the essays sort of move backward and forward in time in that way. They talk about the past and then they talk about the present. And um, in some cases, it's not always clear what's happening in the past and what's happening in the present. Um, others are much more sort of straightforward uh, chronicles. Uh, the last essay by Mahmoud Zaydan is really very much a kind of coming of age story framed by the 1982 uh, Israeli invasion of Lebanon, which he experienced as a young boy, and he sees it through the eyes of a young boy. Uh, but it also uh, takes him back to the stories, you know, the Israeli soldiers coming in and uh, arresting people and um, uh, creating massacres, takes him back to the massacre of Sasa, uh, the village that his parents came from in northern Palestine. And so um, even though it's a chronicle and it sort of gives you almost a blow by blow Israeli invasion in 1982, it also evokes previous massacres and previous displacements and previous uh, Israeli uh, incursions and, and attempts to displace and erase the, the Palestinian people. So time really, I think, yeah, figures uh, differently in, in the different essays, but but the Nekba, the, the moment of 48 is, is always kind of present. It is interesting, right, how you have this kind of layering of, of times and histories uh, in the present uh, when you're experiencing uh, things in your, your immediate moment. Um, those do come across really richly. Um, one last thing before we uh, open it up to uh, the questions, um, I did want to just um, mention, as we all kind of have, how there is such a diversity of voices in these things, and not just diversity, um, you know, in terms of individuals who are from a different location telling stories, but um, also just in 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 relation to the voice and quality of writing. And I'm wondering if it was difficult to capture different styles, different voices um, in your translation, since you were doing eleven of them yourself. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that really also captivated me, especially when you have a writing workshop, when people are interacting and reading each other's work and responding to it, you'd expect more of a homogenization. You'd expect in terms of style and themes, you'd expect that they might sort of converge a little bit or they become very similar. But I I don't know how it came about, what happened in the chemistry of the workshop. But somehow uh, they really all maintain their distinct identity and they really um, all have different tones and different themes and so on. And, you know, I, I did try to capture that with the translation, but I, I wasn't very self-conscious about it. I just let the words kind of take me and draw me into their, uh, their, their tone, their narrative tone. 
Um, and there's something actually that's very liberating about translating because, you know, for someone who finds it difficult to write personal uh, essay or uh, autobiography, uh, because it, I find it hard to find a voice or to sort of strike, you know, the, the tone that I want. Uh, translation kind of also paradoxically frees you up because you just follow the tone, you follow the voice, you try and capture the voice of the author without worrying too much about your own voice or what you, you know, how you, what tone you want to strike. So I found that kind of freeing in a way because these were uh, all essays that were writing in voices that were not my my voice, and I would not have occurred to me to write in this way. And so that's uh, that's a kind of a thrilling thing because you get to experience what it's like to uh, try and convey someone else's voice. Uh, so I don't know. Could I maybe just read a passage just to convey uh, a, 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 the kind of diversity or or one of the voices uh, in this? A book. I find the the voice of uh, um, the essay uh, by Mira Sidawi, "I'm Not Dead Yet," uh, to be quite distinctive because it's very laced with irony, and um, there's something surreal about the the way she describes things. Uh, so the the uh, I'm going to read the opening uh, few lines from uh, the uh, essay. It's called "I'm Not Dead Yet." The scenario in my head is very vivid. I stop breathing, it appears as though I'm dead. I'm carried to the cemetery in the Burj al Barajni refugee camp and I'm buried. I don't like this scenario. I'd prefer to be buried in a different place. The cemetery in the Burj refugee camp is haunted by the corpses of my father and sister. And I think I'd prefer somewhere more spacious. For me alone. I'd be fine in a green space. Yes, a green space surrounded on all sides by the sea. And before my death, I might hang my name on all the trees in that land. I know I spout all this rubbish to overcome the inane longing inside of me. What I really want is to be buried in Acre, Akka. Why not? I affirm and solemnly swear 100 times that I will not rise up from the earth to blow myself up, and I will not harm those who colonize the land. I'm a very peaceful individual. I wouldn't harm an ant, and I don't swipe at the mosquitoes that fly over my head at night. I'm always focused on my breathing and on practicing calmness, and I'm not bothered at all by the narrow alleyways of the camp or the rats. I adore rats. I don't complain about anything. To me, everything is rosy and joyous. So that's just a, an example of a, the kind of tone uh, that uh, some or that's present in one of the essays. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, that is a very interesting essay for sure. Um, we don't have any. I'm, I'm, you know, would welcome people to to put stuff in the Q and A if they they do have a question. Um, I don't see anything there yet. So maybe um, I'd like to uh, turn back to to Nadia and thinking about these different voices. Uh, Muhammad Ali was referencing. How is it that at this, um, you know, sort of collective process of writing the stories, you guys were able to, um, you know, maintain your distinct voices. It sounded like there was a lot of back and forth. You were reading each other's works, you know, critiquing each other's works. Um, how do you feel? Do you want to tell a little bit about um, those various voices and if you recognize them in the in the translations? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if you've read the, the translation, but in the in the Arabic versions that you've read. Oh. As we mentioned, like um, we went through a lot of discussions and a lot of readings together, but there were at some point some uh, resemblance and some some point contradicting approach of telling the story because each one of us, of us is a unique story that have their own experience on personal. Uh, failures, successes, and it all, pre these experience, uh, each of our life experience uh, marks us and made us who we are. And, and that is automatically and sponta spontaneously portrayed itself in our writings and our stories because no minds are alive. So each, each, each one of us had their own aspect or perspective or angle of approaching their own stories or um, their own refugee story. 
Yeah, thank you. Perla, I'm also wondering if there were uh, other additional uh, reoccurring themes that you thought were, were salient, salient for someone who read all the, all the different um, pieces together. Yeah, actually, when, when I was reading, uh, listening to Muhammad Ali now, um, I was thinking that actually, I mean, preparing for today's discussion, I reread the book. And for me, it was a very different experience reading it now, six years later than when I read it then. And I think I experienced what Muhammad Ali experienced when he read the manuscript, because I was gripped by it now. And it's not that I wasn't gripped by it then, but uh, I think because we were reading the essays as they were developing, we were reading them, you know, piecemeal and they were being edited, you know, on a weekly basis. So by the time I had read kind of their final uh, version, their final form, I had already read so many iterations of them that it, it, it's not the same as now when I reread them, you know, six years later. Uh, so they had a really very different impression on me now, and and yes, a very moving and very touching um, experience of reading this. And personally, I think I mean that there's many things that the themes that actually run through them. But um, one I would say, unfortunately, is what I really felt strong about is loss. There's a lot about loss. There's a lot about this pain. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of trauma. And, um, and it's, I think like every story has a death, there's death in it. Um, and I think that really reflects kind of the experience of Palestinians in Lebanon. And, um, and also lost, not just lost by death, but lost by, by separation, by immigration, you know, parent, uh, families being split apart. But there's also a lot of love. Uh, there's a lot of love. Uh, um, all kinds of love, uh, parental love, uh, romantic love, uh, love for the homeland, love for Palestine. Um, so there's there's a lot of warmth there. So which makes the 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 loss that much more actually traumatic. And I think um, also in the stories there's a, there's a longing. There's like a quest. I felt that all the stories really were kind of a, a road being traveled by the authors, and you feel that. This, this road, this, this quest is ongoing. Um, at no point in time, I think like none of the stories, I think really kind of led to an end point. And you can kind of tell that their authors are still to this day, six years later, still kind of on that quest. Um, a quest for belonging, you know, a quest for Palestine, a quest for return, a quest for a place in the world, um, a quest for meaning for life. Um, and again, I was uh, I was moved by the the honesty, uh, the the very personal nature, and and I think that this was um, uh, an outcome of the fact that we were kind of writing to ourselves. We didn't feel like we needed to embellish things. We weren't really worried about how people would interpret things. And you know, I talked of parental love, but there's also a lot of parental violence. You know, parental abuse. Uh, physical abuse and verbal, you know, psychological abuse, a lot of disappointment, disappointment in each other, disappointments in Palestinian society. Um, so I think really the authors were very brave uh, to kind of write about their own personal experiences in a very kind of open and honest way, which is not easy, as Muhammad Ali is saying, that it's not easy to find your voice and to write your own story. So I think really these 11 authors were, um, were really, you know, and very brave at doing that. Yeah, I think brave is a really good way of uh, encapsulating it, right? I mean, just to write anything is brave, and so it's a yeah, no, and and they're breaking taboos, or writing of things yeah. that aren't always you know spoken about. Um, so it's, yeah. it's of course it's not easy. Yeah, and that's part of what makes it such a rich volume that it, it is tapping into some things that aren't always openly discussed, and so that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to just kind of make a connection. You were highlighting uh, death and longing, and I wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, it just made, struck me that you know, even in death, there was a lot of longing in the in the mm -hmm. stories in terms of, 
you know, thinking about um, when someone would be able to return and whether their, you know, memory or body or, or you know, these, these issues connecting uh, longing and death were very, very, very salient for a number of authors. Um, we do have a, a question asking about um, the, the authors in the book, um, how many are, are still living in the camps and after this experience, uh, what opportunities do they have for more publishing? It's a question by Karen Steele. Yeah, uh, uh, well, two of actually, <laughs> I'm looking at the names. So Nadia's in Canada. <laughs> we can go through the names. Um, Intisa is still in Lebanon. Yafa is in Italy. Yus is still in, in Lebanon. Uh, Ruba is in Holland. <laughs> so you get an idea. Yeah. Uh, Hanin is still, the rest are still in Lebanon. Mira is on her way to Germany. That's halfway between Lebanon and Germany. Ataha is in Qatar. Um, so I don't know, that's about half of them um, have left. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of opportunities uh, past, uh, after this workshop, one of the, one of, one author from not this workshop, the next one actually took, uh, got a grant, literary grant to write a book. So some have been able to pursue, uh, you know, further writing, but uh, for many of them, they, I mean, they can just continue their, their normal working lives, but kind of had this opportunity to to sit down and write a little bit about themselves. Okay, um, I, I have just one um, question questioning about um, this notion of being uh, buried. Um, why being buried outside uh, of Palestine would feel significant? Um, uh, I don't know if, if uh, Nadia, you want to touch on that a little bit since you talked about that in your your story yes it it might sound like a cliche but um it's it's where you belong it's it's the right uh, of choosing where to to be buried or where to live but because we are forced uh, into exile we make an opposite reaction we are. We feel like we are more attached, and we are more um, longing to to that homeland that in our mind and in memories, and that shaped us. That is why it feels important. It is like symbolic and abstract feeling and emotion. Thank you. Um... There's another uh, question um, by Alejandro Paz about sort of audiences and in, in the language that the different um, the books are in and what kind of uptake uh, they have. So he's wondering uh, what what is the uptake of the the Arabic version um, uh, versus the English version. And I should mention um, Chinese rights were just uh, taken up for translating the book. So the 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 notion of it circulating uh, in increasingly wider networks in these stories. Um, I don't know Nadia how you feel about your your story being translated into Chinese, but it's uh, the idea of. Uh, of all these different versions um, expands the circulation and the, and the reach of these. But um, there's a question in, in terms of um, what, what kind of uptake did you guys see initially in the, in the Arabic version? Um, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure I understand what you mean by uptake. <laughs> or Muhammad Ali there can is. answer. <laughs> He's taking it up right there. <laughs> no, no, I, I just wanted to show this is the Arabic version. And you also mentioned the other book, uh, we should maybe mention that this has not yet been translated into English. There was another workshop that occurred, also the same idea, but focused more on writing uh, stories of love. And this has been also published in Arabic, but, but not yet in English. Um, about the Arabic uptake, I can't really say in detail. I know that the book was uh, appreciated by a lot of people and there were some reviews, but um, the English hasn't really yet been, uh, I think, widely circulated enough. It was published at the end of um, 2022, uh, and I should mention it was co-published by IPS and uh, OR Books, and which is a publisher based in New York. But we've really only now, this is the first really public event that we have to publicize the book and to uh, celebrate it. And we hope to have uh, at least maybe one more and maybe an in-person event some, somewhere in the US, maybe in New York, 
uh, to also promote the book and to uh, give it a wider audience. But so far, we haven't uh, quite disseminated, I think, uh, it enough in English. There is a question about where the Arabic version could be um, uh, bought yeah. from. Through the IPS website, uh, I think the IPS website will take you to a site where you can buy the book either or directly from them. There's also an e-version. I have an e-version of the um, uh, original book in Arabic, which one can buy from one of the e-book uh, sellers in um, in the Arab world. I think Nilwa Furat. Nilwa Furat, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and uh, yeah, so there's a link there in the chat for how to buy the, the hardcover, or not the hardcover, I mean the, the hard copy, the, the paperback uh, Arabic version. Okay, uh, and we had a, a comment by uh, May Saeli, I think. Go ahead. I think you're still on mute. I don't know. There you are. Uh, this is me, Saikuli. Mm -hmm. Please, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a Palestinian, and I am of the first generation. I'm seventy-eight years old, and therefore. I was a child when I experienced 1948, and it has colored my life, as I understand from the authors of this book, as well as the contributors. And I collected in many of the camps of Lebanon 30 years ago, some of the earliest collections which we need. I am very appreciative of this workshop because it opens our eyes as Palestinians to the diversity of our story. I am a diasporic Palestinian, but I went back and did my collections everywhere within Palestine, North, South and Central, as well as in Lebanon, Jordan, Syria and the West. We need to synchronize all such activities. We need to create a bank of all such works. We have re been remiss in really, I'm at the end, end of my career and my life, but I see in the youth more interest and it is very important that we synchronize we add and all these activities should be put together thank you very much for this workshop thank you mate i don't know if uh, anybody would like to speak to the various uh, initiatives that are involved in this kind of synchronization um I mean, IPS is, I mean, Muhammad Ali can, can speak of that too, is, uh, I mean, there's ma many efforts for, uh, you know, to collect oral histories. We are trying to do a sort of mapping of where, what, you know, the existing collections and seeing if there's a possibility of, yes, of, you know, um, collecting and organizing, but obviously it's, it's not always easy with all the fragmentation. Um, but obviously it's a very important work. Mm -hmm. Mohammed Ali? No, I, mean, I just want to add that, yeah, the Institute for Palestine Studies is always interested in trying to coordinate oral history projects. Uh, Birzeit has a oral history project, uh, Birzeit University in Palestine. The American University of Beirut has a collection of online uh, oral history recordings of Palestinians. Uh, we have a collection which we're in the process of digitizing and and so yeah any effort in this regard I think should be coordinated and and IPS would be happy to to make you know try and uh, bridge these different uh, initiatives. Great um so Mona Haidar had a question about what the stories would mean for uh, future Palestinian generations 
Um, go, go ahead, Mona, if you want to ask your question. Mona? Oh, hi. Um, yeah, <laughs> first, I want to say thank Welcome. you for the authors and uh, this is amazing work. Um, yeah, my question was, as you said, like, um, how do you see like maybe in 20, 30 years, like the future generation, uh, the Palestinian, uh, how will they interact with these stories? What would they mean for them? Um, yeah. And uh, I also mentioned in my question, like it's uh, so wonderful and appreciated to hear authors reflecting on their privileges uh, and how to leverage that to empower the uh, Palestinian community. So thank you for raising that very important issue. I, I, do you want me to say something? I, I, I think it's, it's difficult to predict, of course. I mean, one of the things that stands out for me is that even though the Nakba is 75 years old, I mean, for the contributors to this volume, they, their lives really revolve around Palestine, each in their own uh, separate ways. So the attachment to Palestine, the, fel the sense of Palestinianness, not in a very sort of narrow chauvinistic nationalistic sense, but just this attachment to a particular place and culture and uh, context is still very much alive and undiminished by 75 years of displacement, massacre, attempt at uh, ethnocide or attempt at uh, erasure of Palestinian identity. Um, it's uh, really not affected by by all these um, by all these efforts. And Nadia, I don't know if uh, maybe you want to bring in there uh, a little bit. You mentioned in your your story about having this story written for your daughter uh, or now daughters. <laughs> and so um, do you feel like it would be something that you would be reading with them or something you would tell them about your experiences with the project or how do you see that as a as a document and in terms of well i made my daughter a comment with my eldest daughter read the, both versions of my story in arabic and in english um and she was like of course uh, she was happy proud but like she couldn't put her emotions into words um but it's as as we mentioned it's a legacy it's not about our own personal choices like palestinian crisis is one of the oldest uh, refugee crisis in our modern history and refugees and not only in lebanon and in gaza and west bank in jordan and syria and jerusalem um are also suffering the same and according to UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Work Agency for Palestinian Refugees in Lebanon, Palestinians in Lebanon have the worst living conditions. And she witnessed the life in the camps. Like, as I said, the camp was the only word uh, that we know, not knowing that they're completely different word parallel work outside the borders of the camp. Um, it is important to uh, plant the love of uh, the land, of homeland, the roots, the origin, because it's who we are, it's our identity, right? And to maintain it and uh, pass it on to our uh, children. I have to also uh, to focus uh, on the, the fact that the fair and the like of course with her, but at uh, at small, um, simple way to to make her understand that we are from Palestine. We we were we are refugees, and the only just and fair solution for our problem as being refugee is the implementation of the United Resolution One Nine Four, which is the right of return. Thank you, thank you. I do think we're uh, running at the end of our time now. Um, we did add one final question. I'm not sure if we're able to take it. I don't, I don't know what our restrictions are, but there was a, a question about uh, uh, connections to uh, nature and landscape that were in the stories. Um, 
I do want to say that there are many in, in the stories. Uh, if, if you know you have a chance to take a look at the stories, I encourage you to if you have a chance to look at the collection. But um, Perla, do you have any quick take on that in terms of thinking about um, nature and landscape? I mean, there are, are lots of objects that are filled with uh, a lot of uh, emotion and, and various sort of touchstones for people. I think, as Pamad Ali said, uh, in the stories, there's these two places. There's Palestine with all the trees, the mulberry trees, you know, Shajit Zaytun, and, the, you know, the, the lemon trees. And then there's the camps with, you know, no trees. Um, so there's really kind of this contrast in the book. And the trees are the most valuable thing one could have. Uh, and even in in the story of uh, Intisar, of her grandmother who who uprooted a tree, who's actually a Lebanese, but who lived in Palestine and therefore experienced the Nakba as a Palestinian and ended up living in, in Ain al Hilwe camp, in a Palestinian camp, uh, went to her home village in Lebanon and uprooted a tree. I think um, I think it was a fig tree and fig tree, transplanted yeah. it in, in 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 the camp. You know, so trees are your most valuable uh, possession. I don't know if you can possess a, a tree, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I just feel like throughout the story, there are, are these various objects, whether they're things that were brought, uh, you know, from uh, expulsion or if there were, they were things that were, um, you know, sort of fostered in the new place, uh, thinking of the sewing machine and into Sire's story also is another object that's sort of full of, of history and memory and, and kind of evokes certain things in, in the story itself. So um, I think uh, we need to, to wrap it up, but I want to thank um, all of you, uh, Nadia, Perla, and uh, Muhammad Ali, for sharing your experiences with this project, and for Nadia sharing your writing. Um, it was it was great to hear your voice and hear your hear your stories.